Hello. the generous sponsorship of Mumsy Miriam Sprinza Sara and we are dedicating this year to her grandpa for it is his yard site that's Yitzhak Ben Mayer and also to the generous sponsorship of Razel Miriam in honor that all of Israel and all of the world should have peace for all the families in the world and including uh, Refua Shlima for Isaac Velver, Velver Ben Esther and in walked my holy guest and twin soul sister queen that's ready for Mashiach. Everybody, please welcome the one and only magical energy healing queen, Yochavit. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, <Mary. laughs> oh my gosh, here we are. You feel comfy? I feel great. Okay. Do you guys like our outfits? Do you think we planned it? <laughs> no, we did it. Not again. <laughs> oh, yours is good. It has gold. Ooh, I like yours. Ooh, beautiful. Oh my gosh, we have matching rings. Oh yeah, we do also. That's a great match. <laughs> All right, so we're we're in the process. Here, let me adjust this so it's my team. We are in the process of welcoming the chavre and just doing our usual dedications. So let's continue. We, we Miriam, um, Razel Miriam and Miriam Sprinza Sara sponsored this year tonight so that it was possible um, so Ooh, that we could work amazing. independently and keep spreading Torah to the world. And we also just want to give some shout outs. We share a shout out to Harab Yitzchak Schwartz because yeah. if you're in Jerusalem and you're actually not going to watch, go to his mystical musical meditation. It's like the best thing you could ever do on a Wednesday night if you're not in the mood to learn with us. The highest, one of the one of those like hidden gems of the world. Yeah, <laughs> Rabbi Yitzchak Schwartz. So we shout out to you, Rebbe, our buddy and our Rebbe. Um, also a shout out to Rip Shlomo Katz who like reached out to me to like give me a congratulations on spreading Torah. And I was so touched. Yeah. So yeah. touched. Um, also, we want to wish a continued Aliyat Neshama to Yochi's Holy Abba and his name. Mordechai Israel Tzvi Ben Moshe Aaron. Yeah, she should keep rising higher and higher in Shemaim. Mm -hmm. And the half deal, Refua Shlema, to our precious friend Ravayaz Abba, Zion Ben Tova. Um, and then we have lots of Mazel Tovs. Mazel Tov to Shlomo Mordechai Mitzman on his birthday this week. Mazel Tov to our dear friends Josh and Levana on the birth of their baby boy, Hod Yitzchak. Mazel, Mazel Tov to our friend here, Eliora and Aaron, on their impending wedding. And um, so, yeah, I'm going independent. I'm still working with JIC, but they need in-person classes and I'm not gonna travel every time. So they're still gonna promote this Torah, but I, I'm like open to sponsorship. So if you ever wanna sponsor Shir um, in honor or memory of someone that you love, please reach out and it will be in your merit and in your salute, all the hundreds of people that are watching. So that's really epic and awesome. Mm. So what are we doing tonight, Yoch? I'll tell you. First of all, it's Parshat Balak. And what we're going to do, the plan for the evening, is I'm going to give a lot of context, about a half hour of context and Parsha summary to really bring us into what the heck is going on in this Parsha. And then we're going to hone in on one of the main awesome lessons, which I've never seen about this Parsha, which is following your intuition and trusting your gut and knowing when we're being honest with our inner voice 
or when we're denying it and suppressing it. And so when I realized that that was the theme I wanted to pull out, because I always try to do like a psychological theme from the Parsha that we could apply. And I was like, wait a second. Down the street lives my friend who's like a leading expert on intuition. She's writing a book on intuition and hearing your inner voice. And I was like, yo, come, let's do this year together. <laughs> so we'll do like half hour of context and story and you'll like see what's up. And then we're going to invite Yochin to help teach us. Like, because again, the Parsha is never just about the characters in the Bible. It's always about us, right? Yeah. And so Yochin is going to really teach us how to tune in. Maybe she'll teach us about muscle testing. Maybe she'll just give us whatever insights flow. But I'm really excited. And we're not bound to time tonight. So let us dive in. And anytime you want to say anything or not say anything, just feel free. All right. Oh, I love your necklace. Uh, yeah, also Kabbalistic, you know. Yeah, we got our <laughs> Kabbalistic jewelry on. Woohoo! Okay, so Parsha Balach, it's really, really interesting. Are you ready? Okay, I don't know who to turn to, the screen or you. I'll, I'll watch you on screen. Okay, then I can look at you through the screen. Yeah. Are you you're comfortable? Yeah, yeah. Okay, do you need water? Got my water. Got it. Amazing. Got my crown. Yeah, that's what's up. <laughs> I like your green gems on your crown. Thank you. Do you notice the green velvet on the couch? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's yeah. all it's <laughs> all right. So here we go, my friends. Parsha Balak is truly amazing. I was like salivating over it today. Um I was mamish salivating over Parshad Balak because it's fascinating. So here's the context, okay? We've been through 40 years in the desert. And you and I know about what that feels like, 40 years of this life. It's, <clears> like, <laughs> it's like a little cray-cray, right? And finally, 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 what happens at the end of 40 years in the desert? We're about to enter into Eretz Yisrael. Now, again, let's just recall, and I'm not sure if you've heard this, it's amazing. The metaphor that Chabad brings of the Jewish people going into the land of Israel is the metaphor for the soul going into the body and finally being embodied oh, wow. isn't that amazing oh, wow. so really it's about our journey of bringing our spiritual essence and our soul into ourselves so we can really live as an integrated one but here's the thing we have to think you know in consciousness land the first thing you think is not just about yourself and how things are going to be for you but how your actions are going to affect the people around you so there was people there were people living in Eretz Yisrael and in fact they were our enemies and they were tripping face because they see that we're like right on the border, we're about to come in and we're like millions of people, you know? If like, if you're in LA, shout out, hi mom. Uh, if you're in LA and like, oh also mama, this one's for you, for your foolish lima too. Amen. So, amen mamish. So if you're in LA and you see like three million people on the border, like this is not a political statement, I love my Mexican homies, but like, that's scary, that's like frightening, and they got even more frightened because in the last Parsha, at the end of, where were we in last week's Parsha? I'm spacing out. Space out, okay, that's all good. What happened was we killed Sichon and Ugg, Sichon, Melecha, and Mori. We just wiped out the nations, and so they see, oh no, if they wiped out our enemy who we feel is stronger than us, what are we gonna do? So, there's two nations there, Moab and Midian, but do you think they're friends or enemies? I would go with enemies. They're enemies, yeah. but they decided to unite against the Jews because they were so terrified, okay? So here we have the king, Balak ben Sipor. He is the king of the Moabites, and so he's in charge, and he's the one that has to like figure out what to do with all these Jewish people. And um, so he's terrified, so he calls upon the Midianites to join forces. So what does he do? Oh, by the way, it's super cool. You want to know why his name was Balak, son of Tsipor? Yes. Oh my gosh, so check this out. This is from Midrash Says, best book ever. I always thought there was like a connection. There's a connection there because Tsipor, Tsipora also from the same area. So what's really yeah. what's really interesting is that this week's Parsha, Bilam and Moshe are compared. And so the fact that there's a Ben Tsipor and Moshe's wife is Tsipora, right. there is a connection, but I don't explicitly know what it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But check this out. This is a trip. Mm -hmm. And it's also a shout out to our dear friend Tsipora, who we love. Hi, Tsip. Yeah, hi, Tsip. So King Balak had, had the following special magical power because Balak, he was a superior magician. In fact, he was like appointed to king because his magicianship was so epic. He could like rock the world of Tuma. He knew how to work the forces of impurity. Listen to this. This was like, oh my God. In ancient times, oh, I just learned that the word is not ancient. It's ancient. Yeah. I always thought it was ancient. <laughs> I was like, oh, look, it's an ancient cistern. And then my friend's like, 
what did you just say? I was like, it's an ancient <laughs> cistern. Apparently ancient. Okay. In ancient times, there were people who, by manipulating the forces of Tuma, could create birds, Balak Ben Sipur, that revealed the secrets of the future. Listen to this. They used a certain combination of materials, gold for its head, silver for its beak, copper for its wings, and so on, and they assembled the parts at certain hours of the day where they knew there was like spiritual energies, and finally they inserted in its mouth the tongue of a living bird. They'd put the artificial bird on the sill of an open window so that it faced the sun by day and the moon by night, and seven days later the bird's tongue began to make a tinkling sound, and then the magician pierced it with a golden needle and the bird would begin to talk. So what's interesting is that we're going to learn and talk a lot about sorcery and magicianship in this week's Parsha. And actually, like, the occult continues today. And there really is still a lot of danger in the practice of these things. You know what I'm saying, right? The occult is real. The occult is real. And people really still play with the powers of impurity. And so, again, there's nothing new under the sun. So the forces of impurity being worked with in this world, yeah, it happened then, but it's happening now. Okay, so... He hires this king, Balak, son of Tsipa. Wasn't that amazing about the bird? Yeah, that's actually, I've never, heard, that's kind of far out. It's yeah. so far out. Yeah. There's a lot of this stuff with the Av and the Yidoni and all, like, that's why we keep being warned against sorcery. So he, Balak, who's this great magician, hires an even, let's say, greater magician. He hires Bil'am. Now, Bil'am is like a prophet for hire. He knows how to bless and curse. He was a profound philosopher, a famous sorcerer, a dream interpreter. He was a powerfully effective magician. And check this out. He was Pharaoh's advisor back in Egypt. Who were Pharaoh's three advisors? Mind blown. Bil'am. Do you know the other two? It's so weird. Um, <clears throat> it's so weird. Yeah, what's his name? Um, Eov. Job. Oh, I did not know it was Job. Yeah. yeah. And then the other one is? Uh, Tipora's father, no? Exactly! Yeah. Yitro! So yeah, these Yitro. were like the, the, the Egypt, the, the place of all black and dark magic. These are the three advisors. And check this out. He was the advisor of Pharaoh that told Pharaoh that advice that to heal his psoriasis, that he should bathe in the bath of a hundred, in the blood of 150 babies every morning and every night. Mm. Okay, I didn't make this up, okay? This is from our tradition. So Bilam is bad news. And not only is he such bad news, but guess what he invented? This was also like mind blowing, Shabbat mind blowing. Bilam invented houses for gambling and houses for prostitution. Huh. All harems, har, how do you call it? Har, harem? Is that's that where it began? Yes. You would think it would have started a little earlier in history. This, like, yeah. there was prostitution, as we know from, like, Tamar, but institutionalized houses oh, for prostitution. Yeah, for, yeah, for houses yeah. of prostitution, not yeah. as, like, a side of the road Tamar thing. Yeah, yeah. That was Bilam. Huh. And that's why later in the Parsha, we're going to see that that's why he teaches the Moabite women to seduce them because they knew that the Jews would fall by the power of immorality. He, so, until this day, yeah. everywhere that there is a house of prostitution where poor women are, like, subjected and men are seduced into whatever things, like, thank you, Bilam. And so Bilam was really important. He was also mm. Lavan's grandson. Huh. And that's why he had so much beef against the people of Israel, because he thought, Yaakov robbed my grandfather of everything. Wow. Aren't these connections wow. so interesting? Wow. Yeah, so definitely. interesting. Yeah. So here's the thing, is that God knew that the nations of the world needed a prophet equal to Moshe. Mm. And, well, not equal, because Moshe is the greatest of all time, but with as much potential capability. And so Bilam is like the polarity of Moshe. He's the antithesis because in everything, what's that sentence in Hebrew? So as above, so below. As above, so as below. As above, so yeah. below, which is like one part of the seven hermetic laws, but it's also a Hebrew phrase, but I forget what it is. But the idea is if there was going to be a power, a bright light, a yang of Moshe in this world, there'd have to be a yin of darkness. Oh, equal opportunity. Something like yeah, this. Yeah, equal opportunity that whatever the power of light is, is the equal power of darkness in the world. So that we could be holistic yin yeah. yang. Right. So that was Bilam. He was like the antithesis to Moshe. Okay. So then the elders of Moab, the, Moab and Midian, they come to bring Bilam all these charms and sorcery tools to make sure that he can do it and, and make sure that he can cast all the spells. Now here's the crazy thing. Bilam lives all the way up. And I just learned this from Shammai Siskin. Shout out to you and your sister and your new nephew. He's so cute. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Shammai was teaching me that Bilam lived all the way up in Aram Naharaim by the Euphrates River, which is northern Syria. And the land of Moab is yeah. south of the Dead Sea. So these sending of messengers back and forth to get Bilam on board, because they had to send a few times because God said, no, you can't curse. It's like, I can't curse. But 
they had to travel. This was a course of months that this parsha takes place. I mm. also never thought of this. Mm-hmm, you just mm-hmm. think, oh, they get on their horse and like gallop over to Bilam. No, no, they were traveling from south of the Dead Sea all the way up to northern Syria. So it really indicates and shows how passionate Bilam was to destroy the Jews, that he really had a personal agenda because that's not a simple journey on like what, donkey, on camel? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love putting the Torah into like terminology where we could really understand it. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Okay. So, by the way, just as a side note, we won't get into it. There's so many topics we won't get into because I really want to focus on the psychological point. But if you take Balak and Bil'am, Bil'am you take the Ayn Mem, and Balak you take the Lamed Kuf, and let's see, I'll just draw it right now. You actually, it then spells out, the word, Amalek, Amalek, Mistalek, right? Ooh. Amalek being, yeah, that their energy forces combined bring the energy of Amalek into the world, which is really doubting, trusting God. So that was the general context. Next, yo, we're just going to sum up exactly what happened by credit to Rabbi Andy Shapiro Katz and Rabbi David Foreman. And then, well, you're going to see comes the card that says Yochian Intuition. Okay, so I'm going to read this narrative because I can't say it better than the rabbi who said it, and it's like so fascinating. Mm. We're good? We're great. Okay. Balak, king of the Moabites, afraid of the approaching Israelites, hires Bil'am, a local prophet, a non-Jew. He says, go curse the Jews, they're a threat. So Bil'am, much like Avraham, there's amazing comparisons there, saddles his donkey, takes two youths, it's like the whole thing, right? And he rides up to the place where he can look down over the Israelites to curse them. They're like traveling like above on the desert so they could like look down and see all of them. And it was complicated because we had the clouds of glory. I'm not sure at what point they disappeared because Aaron died in last week's Parsha, I think. So there was some issue with like every nation thought like they're so mysterious. They're like wrapped in this cloud. But he had to like see through and like there's this thing with the tribe of Dan that they sinned so he could kind of get to them. Anyhow, Mm -hmm. so as he travels, he's on his donkey, his she donkey, and something gets in the way. God had sent an angel. And again, in the Avram story, God then sends an angel to stop him. And this angel had a sword. And again, just mind you, that's how he got kicked out of Gun Aden, just for context. He sends this angel to stand in the path. And while Bil'am does not see the angel, the donkey does. And the donkey turns to, to, turns to like stop riding. And Bil'am is like, what the heck are you doing? Why aren't you listening to me? And the donkey sees the angel again, and he like turns the other way. He ends up smashing Bilam's leg and paralyzing him for life. Oh. Yeah. And one of the things, he smashes him up against this rock fortress, which was what Yaakov and Lavan had built to swear they wouldn't hurt each other. And so there, yeah, so the context just keeps coming back and What back. leg, I wonder, is it related the right to the... Leg of the le- to the uh, Yaakov in the left yeah, leg. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. I don't know which mm-hmm. leg, but we should look that up after. Mm-hmm. So, Bilam is incensed, and he whips his donkey, and he hits his donkey with his staff, which is interesting, because last week, Moshe hits the rock with the staff. The imagery is just, like, so repeated, right? Okay. So then he whips him and he hits him to get him back on the path. And the donkey again swerves because he's trying to avoid this angel with a sword, right? Like imagine if there's like someone like wielding a sword in your path, you're like going to want to go the other way. So Bilam hits him again and the donkey gives up and just lays in the middle of the road. Bilam continues to whip it and hit it. And then God opens the mouth of the donkey. It's one of the things that was created in the six days of creation, something supernatural. Mm. And Bilam says, why Bil'am, the donkey says to Bil'am, why aren't you seeing what I'm seeing? I don't understand. God sent an angel to stand in our way and you don't see it and I do. And God doesn't want you to do this, says the donkey, right? It's like Shrek. You know, I wonder if Shrek got his idea of the talking donkey from the Bible. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Yeah. So here's... Or Mr. Ed. Or Mr. Ed. What's Mr. Ed? Talking, talking donkey? Horse. Talking horse. Yeah. For sure. It's all biblical. That was just an old joke. Like, yeah. I yeah, yeah. I remember. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Why are you looking great for 24? So anyways, <laughs> here's what the crux of this context is, and it's so amazing. I never heard this before this week. What Rabbi Shapiro says is we're not looking at two different beings here. We're not looking at Bilam and the donkey. We're actually looking at one being. It represents our intellect and our gut. That we can continue to convince ourselves that the path we're on is the right path and we're doing something that's the right thing when in fact 
it's not. And we're not able to see it. And the only thing that communicates with us and that tells us that what we're doing is wrong is our gut. So the question is, how far do each of us have to go before we will listen to our gut? Before we will listen to our intuition, to that part of our character, the ethical part of us, or at least the godly part of us that's within us. And the guy on the video makes a joke. He says that's even within our limbs, that's even within our... I don't even want to say it, our ASS, because like within our donkey. I think he meant donkey. He did mean donkey, but I think it was like a weird joke. I don't know. I didn't think it was so funny. I guess, yeah. Okay. So this is, does that, does that question help us understand why, why I thought, whoa, this is about our intuition, because the donkey and Bilam represented us together, not two having a debate, but that debate inside of us that's like, yeah, I want to do this. And my intuition's like, no, you shouldn't do that. Yeah, I'm going to do this. And like, at what point? How far do each of us have to go before we begin to listen? Are we like Bil'am? Are we going to see the angels guiding us? So Reformin just kind of deepens this, right? And he brings the idea, essentially, that the great question is, will you look the truth in the eye? Will you listen to your gut, as painful as it is, or will you distort it and not listen? And that's part of why in Pirkei Avod it does this whole comparison between Avram and Bilam, and it says that they had a generous eye or a begrudging eye. And the idea was that a humble, a generous eye understands that what's before them is what's meant to lead them, and a begrudging eye wants to turn aside and like, like it's, it's like more egotistical, that mm-hmm. no, I want to do what mm-hmm. I want to do, I don't want to listen to that voice inside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so this is like, that, that Chiddush in and of itself was like totally mind-blowing for me, like, whoa. This Parsha is about listening to our intuition. So this is where I bring in Yo, and here's the questions that I wanted to bring up, and then I also just want you to like say whatever you feel like, yeah. is just what does it mean to listen to our intuition? Um, where I think there's like two types of intuition, right? There's like the ethical intuition, like what's right and wrong, and then there's just simply, and maybe what's more interesting for me, like how do I just listen to what's good for me? Okay. That's, so yeah. Okay. Wait, I'm gonna ask you a few, and then I'm gonna mm-hmm. set you up just to flow. Mm-hmm. So that's some, and then like, yeah, totally. And then asking ourselves like, really, like, because I really like these classes to be practical. So I don't just want to say like hypothetically, let's talk about intuition, but I want you to look me in the eyes, and I want to look you in the eyes, and ask you, because likely there's something in our life. Likely in my life, I think there is. If I'm being honest. And likely there's something in your life that if you could really ask yourself, am I really listening to my gut or am I trying to deny it and stifle it? So that's like really making it practical. And then the third thing is that maybe you'll lead us in an exercise like or muscle testing or just the concept, something that people could take home with them. Yeah. And after Yoch flows for a while, and we're just going to like schmooze it out and like, this is so, you are so fortunate to have this experience. I'm sorry if that's embarrassing oh, for you. So it's really true. I've learned so much. I actually learned um, like the basics of healing work with Yo. She taught me the Divine Matrix Geula Healing with Shifra Hana Hendry. Shout out. We miss you. Big time. Yeah. <laughs> and I even have still my notes and I look over them once in a while. So mm. we're really sitting with an expert. And then after Yo is done, we're going to bring everything together, including the fact that one of the things, and this is kind of the fourth theme, one of the things that we get blessed. So, oh, sorry. End of the story. Bilam ends up trying to curse the people, but every single time blessings come out for us, <laughs> right? He wasn't listening to his intuition. God's like, you're not going to be able to curse them. They're blessed. And so one of the blessings that comes out, and this is one of the most profound blessings of the whole thing, is the blessing of the messianic era approaching. So I was also connecting that once we truly listen to our intuition and our gut and our soul voice, that is what ushers in the messianic era. So mm. with all of that excitement, no pressure, I think yeah let's i i love that i love that final thing you just said about how it ushers in the, the yeah the gula. it really I, does personal get yeah. for sure listening yeah. in our lives oh my god personal get and then and then and then, and then once there's enough gula. elevated consciousness yeah right so exactly flow do you want to come exactly. closer maybe um yeah okay so you can sure. like sit on top of me basically if you want. <laughs> okay so wow what a honor and gift to be able to talk about this with you and share with other people mm. Intuition, from um, the way when I think about it, it's really your higher consciousness. Am I talking to you? Am I talking to you? Whatever's comfortable. Am I talking to you? I'm talking to all of you. Yeah. So um, it's your higher self communicating with you, and that's coming in all the time. Your higher self is always talking to you, 
and it's talking to you sometimes through your gut and it's something sometimes through your heart and sometimes through other parts of your body so when you start to learn how to listen to your intuition what you're doing is you're tuning into all the different things that you're experiencing it's about paying attention in a different way to everything that's happening in your life and we're all very busy people and we're all living in a very busy world so having the opportunity to tune in in that way is um, these days very rare so it's something that you have to make time for <clears throat> and then it's something that once you develop you can listen in all the time right and and people are born with the ability to listen in different ways people have automatically like higher psychic abilities where they're already tuned in and that way it's very open the channel and then the rest of us can just develop it. <laughs> All right, teach us. What do we do? What do we do? Especially like our culture does not teach us to listen to our intuition. That's not like where we grew up. That's not what, so. How, like, can you do step like step one? Where okay. do we start? Okay, so step l'chaim. one is l'chaim l'chaim. Our intuition comes in in different ways, and different people are naturally tuned in in different ways, meaning through our five senses, right? So pe- there are people who are naturally feelers. They're tactile, they'll feel things more. That's how I intuit a lot of things. I feel it in my body and, and, I, and I understand what I'm feeling in my body. I've learned to understand the language more and more by listening. What's happening in my body is telling me something, right? That's a lot of us, that's a lot of us. Other people, they- Do you have they, an example? My heart starts to beat really fast. Oh. There's nothing that I'm doing that would cause that. Right. Why is that happening? Mm. Am I nervous about something? Mm. Am I nervous about something that I was thinking about unconsciously? Am I nervous about a message that, what's, why, what, what is it? So I just want to stop and listen. What's going on here? What's going on here? Okay. Right? Cool. Okay. It's like first and foremost, like renewing this idea that we can listen to our bodies and our inner voice. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you have an inner truth that's coming through and it's truth. Because what we've been taught very often is don't pay attention to anything that's not your logical mind working out a solution to something, right? That's that you don't want to listen to your emotions. You don't want to listen to your heart. You don't want to listen to your gut. That's not logical, right? That's just all of a sudden you get a feeling about something and you're going to like not go on a trip. What? Like, what is that? <laughs> we have a friend here in our neighborhood that like she's soup. She's basically like already a prophetess. Actually, you know who I'm talking about. We love you if you're watching. And she'll be like, she'll like be hanging out somewhere and she'll be like, God told me I have to go. I have to go now. <laughs> and she'll just leave, you know, and she'll like come back. She's like. God said I could come back. But like because she truly, you know who I'm talking about. Tuned in. Yeah, she's just so tuned in tuned and she in. literally actually listens. Like if someone invites her to a meal, she'll be like, okay, I can go or no, I can't be there. Right. Okay, so so what so what that's bringing up is we were saying before, like the example with Bill, he's, he, the, the donkey's talking and it's like, and it represents the gut and it somehow knows more than the intellect. And like ordinarily we'd think, how would the intellect be the one that's not clued in here, right? Because the intellect is the one that's, that knows, right? And, and, and it's not the case always, because we trick ourselves into things and we talk ourselves into corners and we could really justify just about anything, right? And the more, I learned this from Hannah Rachel Fruman, the more sophisticated we are mentally, the more sophisticated our Yitzhara is. Yeah, absolutely. And will trick us through right. brain. Right, Yeah. which is why it's really difficult being brilliant for people who are really brilliant. It's, it's very hard for them in a lot of ways to face certain things because they could really, they do know better in a lot of other ways. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so what we're saying then is, is that there's a different type of intelligence that's coming through. So we don't want to distrust our mind, right? But we want to learn how to recognize when our mind is speaking truth and when it's not. And we also want to learn how to recognize truth when it's coming in in different ways. Because there's just many forms of, of truth that are coming in, and we want to learn how to pay attention not just to the ones that come in through our mind, through our intellectual reasoning. Okay, so then there's also, we said, your other senses. So it's going to come in, people smell things. They walk into a room, they smell a certain flower, mm. then, they, and then that's an intuitive hit for them. They already get a download on that. They know that if they smell roses, this is what it means, hmm. right? And there's also visual, people see imagery, right? Or even just the feeling in the gut. Yeah, like that's the tactile. Walk. Oh, that's, that's tactile. tactile. Okay. That's what coming. And I think that's the main one for people. Oh that's my god, the main one. And then there's also auditory, so people get messages that they hear. I right? went to a party the other day, and on my way there, my gut is like, "This isn't gonna be good. This isn't gonna be. You're not gonna. This isn't gonna be kosher." And I walked into the party, and there's like really inappropriate rap music playing, and I was like, "I knew I shouldn't have come." But anyways, so yeah, right. Yeah, right. So, you know, they they um they've done uh, 
there's this, this really cool institution called the HeartMath Institute, and they do research. We just make sure to speak up. Okay. Thank you. And they do they do research on um, basically the 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 heart, what's going on with the heart, and how the heart's communicating all the time with with the universe, with the other people, and and what they found was they did this study where they excuse me one second. Hi. Mm. They were measuring people's reactions by they had different measurements on their on their like EKG on their heart on their on their brain and um, on their on their pulse on their hands to measure the sweat reaction and they were measuring people's reactions to um, um, emotionally uh, charged photos that they were putting up on the screen hmm. and what they found was is the reaction time to the, in the heart was the first one before any other part of the body. So before the brain was recognizing it, the heart was recognizing it. The right? heart brain? There's like a heart brain. There is a heart brain. Right. There is a heart brain. And there's also a gut brain. You right. also have neurons in, in neural cells in your in your gut. Whoa. Yeah. And and um and then and then the and then the body would get it. And then the conscious mind would get it. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the the last one to know. <laughs> You know, <laughs> go figure. So, 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 and then, and then, even, even wilder is what they found is that the heart was picking up on these things seconds before they were even showing up on the screen, which means the heart has act like has a way to connect to information that's outside this time and space. Wow. And that's your intuition. It's accessing information that's outside this time and space in the way that we know it. Do you feel that's because our intuition is like a soul voice and that's a godly voice, so it's it's beyond this realm? Like it's that part of our neshama that is not bound by the limited brain and body? Yeah. So basically, yeah, yeah I think what I think we're suggesting that intuition is really tuning into the voice, the inner voice, and the inner voice is really the voice of the soul. And if the soul is a chalak elokami mal mamish, if the soul is a part of God actually, so then it is it is not just limited by by the senses. Yes. Yeah. Exactly that. Exactly that. Yeah. And also, it's not blocked by our thinking. Right? So it can come in and it can give you something fresh and new. Okay. Okay. And so before we were talking about like ethical versus like, right? Like Personal. your ethical. Right. Like, right. You could think like, oh, my intuition just like, oh, like when do I, when am I like a good Jew and like I know to do the mitzvahs? Like there's also like, that is important. Like the intuition knows what's right and wrong, but I feel like I want to access something even deeper. Like, how do I hear for myself? Right. So that's already something that's learned when you go into the ethical. That's already something that you've learned, right? Ah, uh, good point. Okay. So when you go into the intuitive heart area, right? When you open up to that, that's something new that you don't necessarily I don't know where to look. <laughs> I, know, I know. I'm also. I'm like, hey, hey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, can you teach us? Like, can you teach us, like, how, can we, could, do you have, like, an exercise? I know we talked about, like, yeah. Yeah. And, and like, what's the practical, what's yeah. the practical approach on this? Or okay. just anything else, yeah. Right. Okay. So, all it really takes is paying attention and not using the same way of thinking that we're used to doing. So, we've gotten very used to thinking in a very similar way. And so it's kind of like a go-to when we when we when we think we're, we're we're downloading something new, we're really just thinking back on what we've already thought. That's very often what's going on. They say, but by, by by the age forty or thirty-five, by the age thirty-five, we're pretty much set in the way we think. Oh man! <laughs> oh man! We're pretty much a, like just a product at that point of our own our own experiences, unless you start waking up and paying attention to how you're thinking right thinking about how you're thinking and then and then desiring consciously to change that in the areas that you find that you want to change it right otherwise we're just going to keep going like you know we be, we become who we are and then we stay that way okay oh, yeah. <laughs> oh no Shem. Right. right so what's so cool about what like we were saying before it's like our minds get stuck into that certain place that's and then and then you want you want the gut to be able to override that because it has something different to say it has something new that can come in and that's also why it's really important to listen to it. There's a lot to be learned from your higher self. It's speaking to you. And you know what? I love what you were saying before also about Ka'ula. I'm going to keep going yeah, back to that. Yeah, that's what I was actually like, just thinking about. Right, right. So, so what we're talking about here is, is combining the soul with the body, becoming one, so that all your types of wisdom and knowing and understanding are integrated into one whole. 
that's aware and conscious and it's available. It's available to you as you need it in the moment, so, which makes us super processors, right? So we don't have to stop and think about something and then respond to it. We've gotten to the point already where we're so in flow with our higher consciousness that we're just moving with it, right? That's the ultimate goal, that combination, that integration of our higher self into who we really are. Well, into the yeah. practical, into the practical, and that's that is Gula, that is Gula. Okay, well, and we'll comment on that more after we do a little practice. Yay! <laughs> okay. Okay. So, first, just begin by sitting still with your eyes closed, and if you're not comfortable with your eyes closed, you can always leave them open. We just say close them in general mm -hmm. when you do this kind of thing, because it helps you to focus in. It's interesting too, because. I think Bilam is called the guy with the open eye. Mm. Like he like almost refused to tune in. I just caught that right now. Wow, wow. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to move our focus into our hearts. And we're going to start first with collecting our energy in the center of our brain. So feel, feel that there is a magnet that's like a marble in the center of your head. And you're going to let all the energy that you have dispersed all over the place from all the things you're thinking about right now and all the things that you've been dealing with throughout the day and you're going to allow that energy to collect back into you into the center of your head so feel that happening now like a giant magnet pulling your focus right here right now into your center of your head and feel that presence there and you don't want to focus too hard because you don't want to give yourself a headache just feel that presence there. And then very slowly, we're going to allow that presence, that marble, to drop down. So that's your energy focus, and it's dropping down. And we're going to move down through your center to your heart. So you're going down past your eyes, past your throat, and then into the center of your chest so that you find yourself right there in the center core of your chest, which is your heart space. And we understand the heart space to be the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh Kodashim of the body. And that is the place where heaven meets earth. That is the place where your highest neshama comes into your being. It's also the place that the entire body is formed out of. Did you know this? I did not. That's in the cool. in the in the womb, the embryo begins just as a heart, and everything else grows out from the heart. Wow! It's the yeah. epicenter. Yeah. Wow. So come into that beautiful heart center, that beautiful center in your core being, and feel your presence here. Just feel what it feels like to feel yourself here in the center of your heart in this holy of holies in your body and what does your own energy feel like and so this is a very quiet still place this is a place beyond time and space so there's no pressure here because there's nowhere to go and there's nothing to do and in this place you can just be So allow yourself to just be here and sense your own energy here. Welcome your own energy here. And in this place of connection with yourself, we're just going to ask a single question and then we're going to allow the answer to come through. And when you're listening and receiving your own higher knowing, you don't have to process and think about something and figure it out. You just have to listen and receive. So like a question that like we were, were searching for the answer for we want clarity about in our lives? So you could ask anything, literally anything. So yeah, if you have a question that you want clarity on, you're going to go ahead and put it forth. You're just going to ask it clearly and simply. And then you're going to allow yourself to sit quietly and experience whatever sensations come in to your experience. 
They could be sensations in your body. They could be images or thoughts or memories. Whatever comes up is whatever comes up. And we don't have to make it anything. We just have to allow it to be whatever it is. So whatever you're feeling, whatever has come up, you're taking notice. You're not saying, oh, it can't be that. That's not an answer. You're just saying, oh, okay, a heat flash. Or my stomach is grumbling. Okay. And you're just receiving that. Or suddenly you thought of something from your day and you think it's unrelated. Go ahead and receive that too. Hmm. So what we do when we listen is we're letting go of any expectation of how things are supposed to look. Mm. And we're just receiving it as is. It's like exactly the opposite of what Bilam did. Bilam had this hidden personal agenda from his ego. And so he wanted to hear God telling him he could do what he could do. But I think the reverse of this is saying, I'm taking my ego and my own opinions out and I'm just going to listen what God is channeling in and see if I can have the courage to receive that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we could open our eyes now. Sometimes when you ask a question, the answer comes in within the following weeks or days or months mm. in the form of actually the energy that comes into your life experience, right? Or you get an understanding of it later, an actual understanding. But you don't always get an answer the way that you expect it to come. Right, or even sometimes the answer we hear we don't want to hear. And I think that's, at least for me, the yeah. difficult part. Like I've been working with my intuition for a while. Mm, the challenge comes up really where Bilam's came up as Bilam knew like he has to do what Hashem says but like like or I'll ask a question I'll tune into my intuition and the answer I get I don't want to hear because I don't right. want to have to follow it right. and right. I think that's also the big difficulty and, and yet right. we see consistently I know you and I for sure just based on our own personal discussions yeah. we'll have an intuition about something we won't listen and inevitably it always does not turn out yep yep <laughs> yep 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 Oh, really? Yeah, you can't fool yourself. You can't fool yourself. <laughs> you can't fool the voice yeah. of God. No. And it's going to keep talking. It's going to talk louder. It's going to talk louder and louder and louder. Right. So if, if you keep having an experience in your life, it's, it's a message for you. If, you, if you. if there's something in your life that you could say, Ugh, why me? Always me. <laughs> that is your message. That yeah. is your intuition talking to you through your life. Right? It also comes through your life, not just through your body, right? It also comes through that. So what do you do when you tune into your intuition and you hear an answer that you wish you wouldn't have heard or that you didn't want to hear? Like the example that the sages bring is because Bilam is compared to Avraham so often that when, when Avraham saddled his donkey and Avraham took the two youth and Avraham met the angel, he was going to sacrifice his son. His intuition was this voice from God that says, do exactly what you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. So, like, what do you do when the intuition that you receive, the information you see, like, for example, like, a really good example that people bring up a lot is, like, they're dating somebody or they're even married to somebody and they just know inside that it's not right. And yet they don't want to do it. So what do we do when we receive information from our intuition that we don't want to do? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really high level to get to a place where you're willing to receive whatever, you know, no matter what what the reality is. It's, it, you have to be really brave with yourself. You have to have a lot of courage to, and you have to be prepared for, the, for whatever the consequences are going to be, right? right? But what's the alternative? The alternative is, is you're just going to keep getting hit over the head with it. Right. If I don't yeah. listen, it's going to just pan out. now. Because God is like telling me what to do and I'm like, <laughs> it's like if you eat something that you're allergic to, right? <laughs> and no it tastes really good, right? right? right. Like you're going to pay right. the price. Right. That's like me right. every time I try to drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> Even though this was called cheer and beer for a long time, it's like, oh, and you reach, oh, it's so fun to have a beer with friends. Oh, my head. Don't do it again. And the, oh, beer. I'll just have a little, oh, my head. <laughs> 
You know, this is reminding me, Yoch, um, I was, I think I've told the story before, but it's such an amazing story. I was in LA and um, I was seeking some serious healing and I went to this like really, like usually cost like $5,000 a session kind of guy. Uh-huh. I did not pay that, but like that level of like healer person. I mean, that doesn't mean you're a good healer, but whatever. And uh, he's this Australian and he was like six foot tall and like these piercing blue eyes and like long gray hair, right? And he did this whole thing on me and he even like asphyxiated me. It was like a trip and a half. I don't know if I was comfortable with that part, but hmm. I know. Um, but yeah, like, but huh? Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Weird healer experiences. Be careful who you go to. Go to yo. Hmm. <laughs> um, so anyways... But he said to me, because there was like some imagery in his room that I wasn't comfortable with because he was like a man, he wasn't a Jewish healer, he was like a, a healer, worldly healer. And so I walked in and I said, listen, I'm Jewish and I just want you to know like that image is okay, that's okay, that's not so okay for me and I'm not into it so please don't use any of those like powers or forces with me. And anyways, he, he went in and at the end of like my processing, he's like, you know, you know, I can't do Australian accent very well, but. It's going pretty well. I right, thought. yeah, okay. <laughs> you know what the problem is with you Jews? You know what the problem is? Your Torah says, Shmo Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echod, and you stopped listening. Yeah, he's like, the problem with you Jews is your Torah tells you to listen, and you stopped listening. Oh, that was Irish. <laughs> wow, it yeah. all comes down to listen. It's true. It's so much about listening, listening. to God. Yeah. And how do you listen to God is we listen to that voice inside of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And what I think you were saying about the courage to follow it in the high level, that's why these Torah stories are not simple stories, but like the most profound teachings for our lives. Yeah. Is it takes a tremendous amount of courage to A, just be willing to tune into your spirituality, to your soul, to hear it, to be willing to receive it, whether it's weird or you don't like it or whatever. And then like, what do you do when you find an answer that's like not like what you necessarily, what your ego wants? It's like, now how do I listen? Do I consult with a friend? Do I, what do I, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, can mm-hmm. we, can, can you please share with them? I know I've brought up like three times just because I love it and I use it all the time and you taught it to me. Mm-hmm. Muscle testing that you taught me on my thigh. You know, that's so interesting. I was just going to teach a different, not muscle testing, but a different form of tuning in. Okay, maybe that's, we do That's both. related to muscle testing, yeah. Okay. Oh, but the, the, the hand things, I don't use that methodology so much. Really? So, yeah. I use it all the time because of you. For real? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Shifra, Shifra is really the big one into the, into oh, that into the method. Hand? Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. let's just see what yeah. muscle testing is because a lot of people probably don't know. Okay. So muscle testing, your body is cued in to what's going on. So it will give you the message when it thinks something is good for you and when it thinks something is not good for you. So if you pick up a food item that um, your body thinks is toxic, it will weaken your muscles. So then you're, so then if you do something like this, where you hold your muscles together and then you try and move your finger through it to break it through, right. it will be stronger if you're, if you're, if you're not holding that item and then it'll be weaker if you're holding it. And, Whoa, and also if you pick up right, something right, that's right. really good for you, it will strengthen your muscle reaction. Right. And so obviously you're all thinking like, yeah, okay, you're making it stronger or weaker. Right. But that's not the case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the queen of energy work, Donna Eden, actually I'll have, I'll bring her a book is all about the muscle testing, and she's all about, um, well, I'll just bring it so people can see. Mm-hmm. Okay, keep us going. All right. Excuse me while I walk away in my robe. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, the way that I like to teach it initially is that we also will move forward towards things that we feel are good for us, and we'll move away mm. from things that we feel are not good mm-hmm. for us. Physically. Physically, yeah. right? And so this one is really easy for people to sense in the beginning, which is why I like this one in the Ooh, beginning. Ooh, okay. I'm so, so excited. it's time for me to show off oh, my oh, robes. Oh, we didn't tell them why we're wearing these awesome, epic green velvet robes, by the way. Because we both happen to have green robes. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually my Mashiach outfit. I, I like have this in my closet, stashed only for the presence and coming of Mashiach. And because when we begin to listen to our intuition, we're listening to the voice of God, and then when a collective mass of us does that, we're bringing the Geula. So that's why we started with the Song Mashiach, and why I said, hey, Yoch, bring us the crowns. We're doing some messianic work tonight. So we're actually, well, I don't know if that's your Mashiach outfit, but this is one, one option for me. Okay, teach us what to do. All right, so you standing up, just standing up, because this Here, way... Come, come back to the Yeah. Can we do I'm going to stand to the side like this, okay? So it goes like this. When I say something that's true, or when I ask for something that's good for me, something in the positive sense, my body will move forward. Mm. And so you could all try this. 
And then when I say something that's false, my body will move back. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So my name is Yochaved. Mm -hmm. Okay? My name is Neely. <laughs> Am I confused about that? No. <laughs> okay? So it looks like I'm making myself do that. Try it and see for yourself what that's like. Okay, do it for me. Okay? So okay. you just, just make a statement of truth. Okay. Um, um, Start with your name because it's really simple. My yeah. name is Neely. My name is Danielle. <laughs> I'm sitting down right now. Oh, you moved back. Right. Um, I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine how this looks for that? <laughs> what we wouldn't do for the Taira. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. This so, is very similar to the thigh. So your thing. body's giving. It's exactly that. It's exactly oh, that. Yeah. It's okay. Very, it's, there's so the, that that Can thigh I show thing. You the thigh thing. The thigh thing. Okay. The thigh thing. Would you guys like to understand? This is what I use all the time that Yoch taught me. Okay. Thigh thing. Here we so go. So you have your hand on your leg, and you practice at first by programming it. So you program it that when you move your hand slightly forward. Okay. So here's my hand. I'm moving one slightly forward, right on my leg on my arm even, okay, slightly forward, and I say yes, 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 yes. 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 So and I'm training my brain to know that forward means yes. Means yes, right? Okay. And, then, and then you pull your hand back. No. And you say no. And you start programming your hand no. to be no. No. So, so, so we're gonna, we have to do this a little bit in order to actually program it. So we're just going to start with the, pulling it back and saying no. 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 No, 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 and no. you're really taking notice of this. So you're being present in the experience, and you're really feeling what it feels like in your hand as you pull it back. No, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. no, no, mm -hmm. and feel the pull of, of your hand. So you want to keep your hand on, and then pull it. And so you're not even actually at this point really even moving your hand. You're, you're just pulling it back, and you're and you're feeling the resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay, and no, no. No, no, not so fun to program, no. No, not such a fun word to hear over and over. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Okay, and now we're going to do the opposite. So just pushing your hand forward. Yes, yes. right? So you're just moving yes. slightly forward and you're feeling the pull of the muscles. Yes. 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 Do you know how I test this on myself? Yes. I do ridiculous things that I like really want and I'm terrified of. Mm -hmm. So I'll be like, winning the lottery moves forward. Snakes moves back. <laughs> um, God forbid, rape. My hand goes really far back. Um, okay, so. Mashiach, right, you forward. like po things that bring up positive association yeah, and negative association. That's how I do training for right. me. Right. So you, made, you just made me think of something right now. When we do muscle testing, it's, it, so when you ask them a question with muscle testing, you're asking, it's very different than the kind of questions that you would ask your higher knowing through your heart. Okay. Because you, in your higher knowing in your heart, you ask open questions and then you open to receive the information. Uh-huh. Right? That's, that's an outside knowing that's coming in, right? Okay. When you're testing through your muscle uh -huh. testing, it's a yes, no. Uh -huh. It's a yes, no. And we're not asking any kind of like right. Right. future right. questions right. or big life right. questions. We don't do that with muscle testing. Right. Okay. Right. Interesting. So it's different techniques for different things. Like, yeah. so should I go on a second shidduch date with this guy? You could do the yes, no. But you no. could do it. You're the intuition teacher. You could do it, but most likely your body is going to trick you into into like not giving you a higher answer, higher intuition answer, and it's just so going to be whatever you want it to tell you. Oh shoot! Because that's what, what, what that's what could happen. Also, because when you're doing this kind of thing, your body's going to tell you what you want to hear very often. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> so what do we do? There's, that... a, there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of pitfalls to muscle testing. Okay, so then what do we? So how do we? So what's other? So then guide right. us, please. The other thing with muscle testing um, is like if you're dehydrated, it will not work. Mm. Right? Because you're because it's a communication that's happening through your muscles. So it, if there's not enough liquid in there, then it's not happening it's properly. Fascinating. Yeah, wow. yeah. So it's a very different type of reading intuition. It's a different intuition because it's, it's a knowledge that's coming through your body, right? Not through your mind, right? Through your body mind. Right. So... <laughs> Which is a part of your mind. So yeah. what do you recommend then? If, if muscle, t muscle testing is probably a great way to begin just yeah, to it's start... Yeah, it is. It's a great way to begin, right? So, okay, so we're programming yes. So yes, yes, yes. moving the hand forward. Yes, 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 yes. 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 And now what eventually happens with this is like when you ask, when you, when you ask a question, you'll, f you'll feel a slight pull in your hand. 
So it's not like your whole hand is moving, but you'll feel a slight pull backwards if it's a no, and you'll feel a slight pull forward if it's a yes. Right? So why don't we practice? Okay. okay? So asking a question. Okay. Asking a question. Okay. So is today Tuesday? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Right. So, so you don't have to know because your hand's giving you the response. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Right? So, um, right. Did you graduate in 1984? <laughs> See, your hand automatically went back. You yeah. didn't have to, th you didn't have to right. think to process it. Right. Your hand automatically moved. Right. Back. I hope you guys are trying this at home with us. And you're not just sitting here watching us, like, stare at our thighs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And, and so that's how it goes with muscle testing. And it's just the beginning of, of listening, tuning in, and listening. So what happens when I do it is my, I feel a reaction in my whole body. There's a yes in my body and there's a no in my body. And that's also something you want to tune into. What does yes feel like in your body, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what does no feel like in your body? So let's do that for a moment, right? Okay. Yes. What does yes feel like? Yes. Yes. And so what people have said to the, mm -hmm. to the word yes, it's like, it feels like a burst of fresh air, right? It feels like, like, uh, like freedom. Ease, it comfort. Feels, mm -hmm. And what does that feel like in your body to you? What does that feel like? Please what feel is, free to write in the comments. We mm -hmm. love, we love that. So what is, do you get a, do you get, what kind of sensation physically happens in your body when you say yes? Some people say it feels like their favorite, their favorite clothing that they put on, right? Feels like a nap. <laughs> <laughs> so feel yes, feel yes. And the, the reason that's important is because when you walk through life, you want to check in with your body. Is this a yes for me? Mm. Or is this a no for me? Yeah, that's what I do all the time now with like, especially with Shabbat. Like, do I want to go here? Do I want to have this guest? Do I want to be a guest? On Shabbat is a great time to use your intuition to check in. Like, where do you actually want to be? And what I love about this, yo, and I don't mean to interrupt the flow, is that it's so self-honoring and actually, a lot of people talk about self-love and self-care often. And while self-love and acceptance are the core and crux of all healing work, it begins with honoring your body because you can't love and accept yourself if you can't trust yourself. Right. And if you're not listening to your intuition, if, if you've ever struggled with trust issues yeah. with self, that's probably because you haven't yet started to check in with your intuition so that you can really honor what is good? What is a yes and what is a no for you? Okay, beautiful. Because because very often we um, can you come closer. We get we get the, these you. these intuitions and we don't listen to them because we don't trust ourselves. Right. Right. And so the the thing about your intuition, it's kind of like if you had a friend who you never spoke to and didn't trust, how much would they continue to stick around? Right. So what happens after a while is our is we get tuned out. We you know, and then when we start to tune back in, a lot of people have an experience where they're where the, where like their inner child is really like pissed off at them for not having been there for a while. Mm. Right. Others are not they they're not so upset. So, but what happens is is like the more you tune in and the more you trust and the more you listen, the more your intuition will talk to you. And then you'll really get guidance. And like, that's just what we need right now because it's at this point, we can't process everything. There's too much that's going on. We can't use our, our processing to have to figure every single thing out. And not only that, because we don't have the time to half the time to think everything through in that kind of a way, right? When you get an intuitive hit, it's a right now kind of a thing. Right. And so first of all, everybody's using it all the time, by the way, we really are. Because like, if you're driving, you're using your intuition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, what you're going through life, you're using your intuition. There are moments where you're allowing that to flow through, but you're not even realizing that you're doing it. I just out of curiosity, personal questions as you're like the intuition guru, for lack of a better word. Like, what does it do for you in your life? Like, what is the change? Because, you know, a lot of people that are watching are so profound and, and learning Torah, but not necessarily have thought to put intuition or um, this idea of following their inner voice or listening to their soul voice. What does it do for you in your life? Like, what has that changed for you coming into a place where this is such a central part of your existence? Yeah, it, it's uh, created a lot of um, ease for me. Because I don't have to have anxiety over, am I making the right decision or not? Right. It's just like, okay, this is what I'm feeling and I'm going to trust that and right. I'm going to go with it. Right. And, um, and that I don't have to ongoingly question and question and, and, and did I write, make the right decision or is there more details that I'm not considering and should I keep weighing this thing out? It's like, no, this is what I'm feeling right now. So 
I'm yeah. going to go with that. And what's amazing yeah. is that in our friendship, her honoring her intuition allows me to honor her intuition. So like in the past, I used to throw a lot of parties and I'd be like, yo, come to my party, come to my party. And she'd be like, no. And I'd be like, oh, cool, good. I'm like so glad you're doing what's right for you. And like, I think that I have been inspired by your like, really honoring your inner voice because mm. then now way more now like if I yeah again like if I'm invited to do something like initially I was such a clever girl I would just be like yeah sure whatever and now I'm like wait a second let me see if that's actually good for me and then when I learn to say no and I'm honoring myself and I'm respecting myself other people also honor and respect yeah. Yeah. and what's amazing then is in friendship if Yoch shows up like, that's because she actually wants to be there. And how comfortable does that make me? Mm, and if mm. she's not there, it's just because it's not right for her. Mm -hmm. And I can honor it. But then anytime we do show up, we can then begin to have not just trust ourselves, but a world where we can all trust that everybody's doing what's good for them. Yeah, everyone's doing what's good for them. That's beautiful. And, and also, I'd say what it opened up is, um, is a greater synchronicity. Oh, yes. Yeah. Say more, because though. I, because, I, because I'm following the path that's not necessarily the most obvious path, but it's actually the one that's going to be the best for me. That's going to open up the most for me, right? And then I and then I don't have to struggle with other things. It, it shortens the path on things, and and the other thing that's been really awesome is it helps me to recognize opportunities when they come my way. Mm. I say a line more on that. Uh, because I've got an intuition about certain things that are right for me, right? So then when they actually occur, I'm like, yes, that's it. I'm going to say yes to that. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. So, Yo, I want to honor our time because I, I, well, I, I try to right. keep the sheer to an hour mm -hmm. and I want to just sort of sum up and bring it all together. So, yeah, I really honestly, okay, so rewind, we were looking, we have been looking at Parshat Balak in a completely new way. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, we, there's just so many ways, so many takes on this Parsha, but one thing I want to just note now that came to me is Balak, um, pardon me, Bil'am, the prophet for hire, he knew, Hashem said no, he heard Hashem. Hashem said, no, don't go with them, don't curse them, it's not going to work, they're blessed. And he's like, all right, well, uh, he heard the voice of God, and then he like tried it again, and he still tested out, and it turned out being bad for him. Because in the end, he did yeah. the opposite of what he wanted to achieve. He yeah. wanted to curse the Jewish people primarily so that he could get money. He could get all this wealth that Balak was offering him. And the end, he ends up blessing the people and he does not get fortune from Balak. He even tries to chase Balak and Balak, does, he mamish doesn't pay him. And then Bil'am, who once had this reputation as this amazing sorcerer, like his reputation fell on the floor. Mm. Um, so really, Bil'am paid the consequences and... Uh, partially, I think, just to teach us about, to teach us, me and you, about this just new idea. I love, I love the Parsha. It's just like, we're such a cool people. Every week we just take something out of it and like, see if we can enhance our lives. I just love it. And again, like, I love the, I love, I love learning the context with everybody. I won't do a summary, but you can go back if you want to. And I also really love that, you know, if Balak and Bilam, the powers of not listening to your issue and intuition and like doing what you want for your ego, for money, for power, for fame, which is usually what the ego is chasing, some form of glory or see me this way, or I should choose to do this because then people will see me as this, you know, that actually brings... Um, destruction in the world it brings Amalek it brings doubt into our heart and mistrust of self mm. whereas the the blessing that Israel gets again that Bilam really is predicting is this age of the Mashiach when a star shoots forward from Jacob and ushers in like a new a new light a new understanding yeah um, so I just love that also the, the equal and opposite forces of the supreme doubt and our supreme redemption, which is our, our what's being presented in the Parsha, is Amalek and Mashiach. And that's exactly what happens when we're in inner torment or torture, when we're not listening. It's like so full of doubt. What's yeah. that line that the, like the highest blessing is like the, the annulment of, of doubt, of Sveikot? I didn't hear that, but that sounds really good. It sounds yeah, right the like, greatest joy is when you release doubt, release Amalek. And what is the greatest joy? It's when we tune into that messianic light. Mm. So, gosh, do you think we need to review any of the other topics that we brought up? Or I guess I'll ask you. This is what I'm at, at the end of my sessions. I'm not doing a session with you. At the end of my <laughs> sessions in therapy or just when I'm like really just in, in like giving a share to my students, I ask the people, well, what stood out for you? Like, 
does anything stay with you? So does like anything stand out for you from our schmooze? I mean, I really, I think I'm, I'm kind of taking with that whole bird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm also thinking of it in terms of, um, what was the statue that was made? Um, the, was it? In, pe- or the end yeah. of the Parsha? Yeah, yeah, that's really gnarly. Yeah. The end of the Parsha, which I didn't tell you, because uh, it comes up next week in Pinchas, is that like we said, they were failing at cursing them. So they sent the Moabite women to come seduce the Jewish people because they knew we could fall by immorality. Um, and that the way that they said, the way that it wasn't just that they wanted to seduce them with Moabite women, but they wanted to get them into idol worship to worship Baal Peor. Right. And Baal Peor was this idol that we worship through sex and excrement. That actually the way you serve this idol is you would defecate all over the idol. And that the women seduced the men into doing it and like this whole thing. And it was just like the base of the base. But why, why were you asking? I wasn't actually thinking of that one. Oh, <laughs> oh that's the idol. It's, from it's interesting because when you were saying that, it was making me think like, yeah, that's exactly it. Like when we, um, when we go down pathways that, <laughs> you know, where we're not listening to our intuition, we get involved in activities that could actually Mamash. cover it up more. Mamash. Because those, like, it Good kind point. of like creates, it creates more of a barrier to being able to tune in. Yeah, and then yeah. like life gets S H I T T Y E, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's hard and it's courageous and it's it's a really, really massive leap in ascension in consciousness when we integrate or begin to just even take baby steps, right? Practice the hand motion or the leaning forward, lean back. Like I really like when I listen to Shears and they recommend to do something, I try to do it because or else it's like in one ear out the next. So um I'll give a bracha and then you wanna give a bracha? Oh, yeah. You want to give a bracha and then I'll give a bracha? Okay. You start, yeah. Okay. okay. So okay, So I'll give a bracha also with a little tidbit. Yeah, um, totally. So this is this is another shout out to Rav Yitzchak Schwartz because this is his methodology. So he says, walk around and check out. So we we're just talking about feeling a yes in your body. So feel the resonance in, in what percentage of yes you have, right? So like as you walk by a person on the street, 60%, 70%, 80%, 20 percent like what do you what do you like how much of a yes are you feeling on that person oh yes percentages you, yeah, i love that percentage right. of the yes like when you walk into a store when you walk into a room how much of a yes are you are you feeling over there start to feel what your connection is in your heart what the resonance is of what of what you're of what's coming in so i want to bless everybody to uh please god have opportunities to tune in and really make an effort to tune in that it should feel like an easy natural thing for you and that you should really um automatically trust what's coming through for you and understand that it's your own truth and follow through on it and allow yourself to receive your own wisdom. Yeah, and trust that God will work it out for the good. Yo, amen. Uh, uh, when you, amen. When you were talking, the bird idea came to my head. If This is what they were manipulating birds for the sake of the occult and the, and the evil and the dark and the Satanistic vibes. Mm-hmm. Actually, Rabbi Nachman talks about how the song of the birds is the secret to all music. Mm. And we know that when Mashiach comes, we're gonna have the final song of Mashiach. So the bird really can, I think they were taking this high messianic energy and like manipulating Ooh, it perhaps, oh wow, yeah. or something mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and part of my blessing is I'm just gonna read again the little commentary that brought us in, because if you wanna give this over at your Shabbos table, you might wanna review. So here's the thing. If, so here's how you say it, okay? So remember, so there's Balak the king, he hires Bil'am, Bil'am takes his donkey. And what we're learning is that we're, I'm just going to read it again. We're not looking at two different beings, Bil'am and the donkey that are having this debate. Here, Bil'am and the donkey, we're looking at one, we are looking at one being, the intellect and the gut, the struggle that you and I face every time we have conflict of interest between what our heart says to do, our gut says to do, and our head says to do. So we can convince ourselves that the path we are on is the right path or we're doing something that's the right thing when in fact it's not. So again, this is an invitation to take a look at our lives and see like, where am I honoring my gut and where is my gut saying like, no, like, come on, girl, you know, you know the answer is somewhere else. Um, So when in fact it's not and we're not able to see it and the only thing that communicates with us and tells us that what we're doing is wrong is our gut. And the question is, and here's the challenge and the blessing, how far do each of us have to go before we will listen to our gut, before we will listen to that part of our character? And I'm really blessing us all with the courage uh, to tune in to our godly soul and our inner wisdom so that we are one step closer to our personal geula, so that when we're all one step closer, we'll raise the collective consciousness and really just be able to tune in and enjoy this final messianic time. Amen. So? Amen. <laughs>
There we go. D -d 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 DJ Neely and Queen Yochi out. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to talk about Torah and psychology and like uh, may it be a blessing for all of our lives. And thank you again to our sponsors, to Patty Gieber and Razel Miriam. You made this possible, and the salute is for you, girls. Wow, yeah. See you next week, please, God. Hey, if you want next week's cheer, <laughs> please feel free to sponsor it. <laughs> Bye, guys. Just yet? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs>